Should we be able to live without some of the modern common, you know, comforts? Would we be able to live without electricity? Should we do, can we live without, um, you know, having cell service? Can we live without being able to have transportation somewhere? Can we live without communication without, can we do all those things? I think those are important questions to ask. And, and it's not that, oh my gosh, if I can't do that, you're going to die in the next year, but no, but how prepared are you for any given scenario? That's education. By the way, even if, okay, grid doesn't go down and, and um, everything's going well there, but all of a sudden um, everybody realizes that the Fed has been screwing us this entire time and money goes away and now it's a digital, you know, sort of cool. cool. What are you going to do with that? How prepared are you? Do you understand how money works? Are you actually protected? Or are you just going, uh, I don't know, I was told to just go to work for 30 years, throw things in a 401k. Okay, cool. What happens if the market crashes? What are you going to do? Every single bit of this goes beyond just physical. This is just preparedness in, in general. general. Thank you to Paleo Valley for sponsoring this episode of the show. Paleo Valley beef sticks are some of my most favorite go-to high-protein snacks. They are 100% grass-fed and grass-finished. They are sourced from small domestic farms. They use organic spices. They come in different flavors, whether it's original or teriyaki or summer sausage or even garlic summer sausage. They are fermented, which is probably one of my favorite points about this product, which creates this naturally occurring probiotic. And of course, they taste amazing. Paleo Valley is offering my listeners 15% off. You can use the code Dr. Lion or go to paleovalley.com slash Dr. Lion. These Paleo Valley beef sticks are amazing for on the go. People and patients ask me all the time, how can they plan for travel and just being out and about? This is a great way to do it. Grab yours, 15% off, paleovalley.com slash Dr. Lion. Matt, Boudreaux. Nailed it. Thank you so much for coming and sitting down and talking with me. I know that your message will impact many of the listeners. You are on a mission to change the future of our children. Is that accurate? Extraordinarily accurate. Tell me, what are you doing? So everything we're doing is under uh, the Apogee Strong umbrella. And we talk about our mission as getting back to sovereignty and freedom by educating the entire family. That's the biggest blanket statement I can give you. And we'll talk about all the different, you know, verticals of how we're doing that. But that's really what it is for us. You know, Tim and I put this together with the idea that sovereignty and freedom, these are not things, these are things that people talk about, but we don't understand how to pursue it. And you understand how to pursue it through being educated around what that means. And so everything we're doing is education. And the primary individuals that you are educating because there's a difference between schooling and education bingo but you have this apogee is essentially um it's a it's a how would you describe it it's not a school it's a we got physical campuses coming though so we've got we've got all these different verticals that are designed to be able to stand alone and they all culminate and, and come together through our, our physical campuses too. So we've got mentorship for young men. Why would that be important? So why would mentorship for young men? Holy moly. So schooling, what you said, schooling and education, right? Vastly different things. Schooling is, is the biggest religion in this, in this country. We've been taught that school looks a certain way. You go at a certain age, you do a certain thing at a certain time. And hey, by the way, young men or young women, that's what everybody does. Right. And that looks exactly the same. And if you don't play that game well, ah, something's wrong with you. How does right? that? And, and by the way, yes. BS. <laughs> and schooling, would you say that that indoctr- indoctrinates the way our youth think? It's 100 percent indoctrination. That's what. So, by the way, that's what it's designed to do. But it's not even just indoctrination around the agendas that we're seeing play out. Right. And you got a lot of people that are, are being very you know, vocal, rightfully so, about the agendas that we're seeing playing out in our schools. But for me, it's a sneaky indoctrination of the design of the whole thing in the first place. Right now, you and I both know people that did really, really well in school. They did really well and they're struggling in life. We both know people who didn't do well in school and are crushing it in life. Well, those are two very different games. School and life are not the same, obviously, 
But we've got this belief, this emotional attachment to the belief that school is designed the way it is based on some sort of human development and based on the fact that you've got to get the development to look exactly like this for life to work out. That's provably garbage, right? So the indoctrination that I'm most worried about are the habits that you build for 12 years, the habits that you build of blind obedience, the habits that you build of well, who's the authority, the habits that you build of going, hey, government, tell me what to do because the government's telling me what to do and when to do it from the time I'm five years old and on, right? So we've got that habit that's built. You're, you get into the habit of going, hey, um, I'd love to write my own story, but I'm gonna go ahead and hand the pen over to somebody else. They're gonna write the story for me and they're just gonna tell me what to do. You do that for 12 years. It's really hard to be able to think for yourself, to educate yourself, to move forward in your life without going, hey, somebody tell me what to do and when to do it. Mm. That's the indoctrination I'm most worried about. And going back to one of those original questions, young men in particular are not suited for that. So what are we doing in our schools? We go, okay, well, he's five, um, you know, and yeah, he wants to be outside and he wants to be running around. He wants to be playing. He wants to be, you know, a five-year-old young man. He wants to be physically active. But what we need him to do is sit here for six hours. We need him to sit down. We need him to be quiet. We need him to to, to listen to somebody who would bore the hell out of basically anybody, right? And look, and there are, there's brilliant teachers out there. I have nothing against good humans who are teaching, but the system says, follow this script. And so somebody can come in, step in and, and follow this script and go, no, 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 sit, obey, do right. We're, we're taking him out of his natural environment. And when he has a trouble doing that, we go, ah, he must have a methamphetamine deficiency. Right. So I think that's what it is. We better get him on some meds We better get him on some meds quick. Right. And so it's, we are, we are literally attacking the foundation, the factory settings of these young people. We are attacking the foundation yep. factory settings of the, these young men. That's exactly it, man. We are disrupting. It's like if you took a phone, you got your factory settings and you just start adding a bunch of malware and a bunch of garbage apps and you get a bunch, what happens to that phone eventually? It does not function. Do you think that that is why we are seeing what we're seeing in the world? For example, 70% of Americans are either overweight or obese. Mm. The uh, way in which we function, just the honor and integrity mm. and just the things that we're seeing do you think that that's the the root cause? It's a mul I believe it's a multifaceted issue, but I do believe that's a huge part of that that doesn't get questioned enough, right? We question the agendas, the sexualization of kids, the you know pornography in schools, and all, rightfully so. We are questioning those things, but we're not questioning the system as it's designed as becoming this thing to make somebody apathetic. So then you are now more prone to being you know, uh, to, to suggestibility, right. Of any kind of outside source. And because you are living a life where you're just kind of apathetic, then you get out and you're looking for, how do I just distract myself? You know, people, it's just, I guess I'm learning while I'm over here. We confuse schooling with education. So I guess I'm learning and I kind of hate learning. I need something to take my mind off of it. TikTok, video games, right? Distractions are a plenty. So it's this multifaceted thing. And so then you got a, a group of parents who are now, grew, you know, they grew up in the same thing. They're going, hey, Johnny, you can be anything you want. While Johnny also hears them say, it's Monday. I hate my job. I hate my life. I hate the parents aren't leading by example, right? And so it's been this- Parents are not leading by example. Would you say- all. You know, and people will say, maybe you guys will skip through this episode because you don't have kids. That's the wrong thing to do. Oh, 100%. Because you have also gone through the traditional schooling system. Bingo. So every adult out there needs to hear this so that you can begin to reevaluate the way in which you are processing the world. A hundred percent. So here's the deal. If you are not a sovereign human, and when I say what sovereign, yeah, what does so it mean? again, sovereignty to me and the definition of terms always matters, right? Socrates says the beginning of wisdom is the definition of terms. So definition of terms always matters to me. Sovereignty to me means I'm going to have the ability, understanding, and bravery enough to do what I want to do when I want to do it, with whom I want to do it with, without infringing on the rights of other people, right? I don't answer to anybody. I don't work with anybody I don't want to work with. I don't work for anybody I don't want to work for. I have control over the things that I can have control over. That all comes through education. I've got to be educated on how to be physically sovereign. I've got to understand what health and fitness really looks like. So I can embrace that. I can be brave enough to make that a consistent part of my life and I can move forward. I've got to understand 
how the financial game actually works. What is money actually do? like? What can you do? What does that game look like? I don't have to be in the 1040 tax world like everybody else. I can look at the 1041 system, which allows me to save more money and give more money. I can. There are so many things to be educated upon. So if you're whether you have kids or not. If you are not a sovereign being, you've got work to do. And hey, by the way, if you're a sovereign being, you still have work to do. <laughs> Growth is the natural state of a human. Mm. We stop growing, you start dying. There, like nothing is a neutral. My question to you is, why you? Why now? And I, before you answer that, I want to just mention a bit of your bio. Mm-hmm. You've had, you have an extensive bio. Um, Not only have you, you were named, by the way, Corporate Trainer of the Year at Stanford University. You've spoken to over a quarter of a million people. You've done a two-time, you're a two-time featured TEDx speaker. You've just done so much. You've educated in and utilized the Socratic method, which we are going to have to talk about because embarrassingly, when I was prepping for this, I was only aware of my shortcomings through education on a very superficial level. And that's one of the reasons I'm so excited to to sit down. And I consider myself educated, successful, capable of defining and working through a life that is by my own design. And even through that, I have fallen, I don't want to say victim, but almost indoctrinated into the traditional way of thinking. So why you, why now? It's a great question. That's a, that's a big question. It's a heavy question. Um, because I'm not, uh, I, I, I'm very comfortable in, in saying that I know the game inside and out. And when I say the game, I mean the game of school and how that differs from education. And my, um, my, my background there, you know, Naval talks about uh, specific knowledge, right? So my experiences, the things that I know, the things that I can bring to the table. So my experience in, in, you know, at Stanford in public schools as a public school teacher and public school administrator in private schools as a teacher and administrator, starting my own campuses, speaking to all these organizations. When you're talking about the number of people I'm speaking to, I'm speaking to, you know, U.S. Air Force and Lockheed Martin and Purina and National Security Center and American Eagle and, um, you know, Amazon and Google, and these are all my clients. And so I'm speaking to these organizations and I'm hearing what they wish they saw from young people, what they're not seeing. So I've got a that's unique- interesting. That's, that's interesting. Very much so. They want something different. hundred percent. They do. The people that are moving the needle in the world are wanting and needing something different. You bet. But but these we're, kids have been put into a pipeline with the expectation. Do the same thing. And the organizations a lot of times are still asking for this. So like that's part of the frustration, right? Is they're going, hey, we want something different, but what are they doing? They're still recruiting the same way. They're still asking for resumes. They're still asking. But you start talking to these guys outside of it and they're like, we don't really care about the resume. We don't even care about the college degree anymore. We don't really care. I mean, that's the normal thing. We're like, well, we want somebody who holds our same set of values, who comes in and provides, you know, value right away, who has an idea of how this whole operation works, who hasn't like, we don't care if they're asking questions. We want them to ask questions. We want them to be okay with making mistakes. We want, they're saying these things, but they're setting up a system that makes people believe, okay, it's still the whole traditional route. If you got to go to call, you know, get good grades and you got to go to college, that's a whole game in and of itself. So there's so many of these conflicts. So as far as why me, I don't think it's a me. I think it's an us. It's an us, right? So I can speak from that perspective, but I can also speak from the perspective of being a parent and, and watching young people thrive working with thousands of young people over two decades, seeing who's thriving, who's not, finding these patterns, and then getting to work with so many of them. You know, we and I were talking about all the amazing individuals we have in common, right? All the friends, mutual friends that we have. These are high level human beings. So watching them, figuring out how they operate and going, okay, what are the patterns of success, right? Having that at our fingertips. And Tim and I can go, okay, here's what we're seeing here's what we can offer. We're giving you a roadmap for you to eventually get to being uh, at a point of educating yourself. Uh, and we've got a lot of people who are seeing this too. So I think the the us really comes down to, we have the ability to see all these things, bring these people in, 
but also get to the masses and get this going quickly. This can't be something that's done in the next, you know, 20 years. This is something that needs to be done now. Desperate. <laughs> Desperate. I love, and you referenced Tim. This is, yeah. we're talking about Tim Kennedy. Yep. Love Tim Kennedy. Yeah. Great guy. What is the program that you've developed? So we start, so I love to, I would, nobody else I'd rather do this mission with, man. Um, if you don't know who Tim Kennedy is, you're missing out. He's exactly who you think he is too. I mean, he is that wild. He's that crazy. But if you listen to him, He's that brilliant. He's that. He's one of the most intelligent humans I know. I know. He is one of the most intelligent humans I know, and his heart is as big as freaking Texas. You know, I've spent time at his house. He's he's a phenomenal husband. He's a phenomenal father. So nobody else I'd want to, um, you know, be on this mission with. So we started Apogee Strong. I had I had um, started a couple of schools, or three schools in California, and I had the largest Socratic uh, base K through twelve in in the nation. So started that, and I'd started that for my for my kids and invited other people to come along and and we had been wildly successful and and a whole lot of fun so did that tim i heard tim on a podcast saying he wanted to start a school i'm like hey i know how to do that um let's connect so helped him start getting going at apogee cedar park um but we went hey man we've got so many mutual friends we have so many guys in our corner i have good men at my finger that i can call i can pick up a phone and go hey man and they're going to answer the phone they're good men doing good things in the world tim obviously is connected to a lot of good men doing a lot of really good things in the world we talked about the problem earlier for young men they're not being given these great role models they're not being um you know feet held to the fire and going look man here's what it means to grow up to be a good man so that's where everything started knowing that multiple dominoes would fall. So we started with the Young Men's Mentorship Program, Virtual Mentorship Program. That? We started that three years ago. Um, so the Young Men's Mentorship Program grew very quickly. We've got hundreds of young men all over the world. And we kind of focus on that 12 to 18 year old range. And they've got a very specific 12 month roadmap that they go through. And we're not saying that this is the 12 month road. We're just saying it's a really good 12 month roadmap of actual educational experience. There's sales, there's marketing challenges, there's public speaking challenges. They learn to get in contact with and interview, you know, LEO and military and CEOs. And they start putting together this digital portfolio of their journey into leadership it is not school in the least. I love it. Journey into leadership. Exactly. And they're documenting the entire thing. So they got this roadmap they're going through. They've got recommended readings. They've got workouts that we're sending them. They're in a private platform where we're pouring into them every single day. And then every week we are bringing on the best of the best of the best to speak with them. And when I say best of the best, I mean, you, I mean, you name it. We're talking about Bedros. We're talking about Ray. We're talking about Andy Frazella. We're talking about, you know, Patrick, Bet David, we're talking about, I mean, we have had all these guys come in and speak with these, not speak to, speak with. The young men are on the calls with them, hearing from the best on how to be the best, right? So we started out there. And by the way, if a young man pours in for those 12 months, if he actually shows up and does the work, we'll work with them forever. No charge. They stay with us. We've had young men who have now been with us for three years. Like we will continue to pour into these young men forever. So we started there inevitably. And we knew these would be the dominoes. We had dads going, any chance you want to do this? Like, I wasn't ever educated. I was schooled. I wasn't educated. I'd love to have something for men. I'd love to have something for men and, and maybe even have a roadmap that also talks about marriage, talks about relationships, talks about raising, you know, the next generation, talks about like business. I don't know how to do this. I'm afraid to step out and start my business, right? I've, I've just followed the path. And so inevitably we had all these dads asking, so we develop something for men as well. So now we have, you know, about a thousand men um, from around the globe going through a very similar process, speaking to the same caliber of humans, their challenges, their projects are more intense for sure. Good. <laughs> as they should be. Um, but it, it's an amazing opportunity for these guys to grow. That turned into, we have our ladies program. We got our young ladies on the way. We've got about 300 families around the world that we uh, help through home education. We have some mutual friends of ours that, that do that, that are in that program too. Um, and now we're launching our physical campuses. We've got our Apogee Cedar Park that, that Tim runs uh, and in Cedar Park, in Texas. Texas. Yep. And then we, we went, Hey, um, we need to bring this physical location because we have some people that are like ah i'm just not going to get out of the physical space i need a physical space for my young heroes so we went with an affiliate model um much like crossfit right we have people apply 
to be able to 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 run one of these and we give them the the keys to the castle like here's how to do it here's how to do it well we have a massive support system we're building out the entire year for them but they have the intellectual freedom to say hey okay i, I kind of want to tweak it you know i want to do this so we got about 50 physical campuses k through 12s young men young women that are launching in the fall and we think we're going to have probably another hundred that we'll do next year Incredible. Um, we're asking for just good humans who believe in this mission of character and values and real education to 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 chat with us and see if you want to bring it to your community oh and by the way mom and dad when your kid goes to one of those campuses you automatically get to go through apogee man and apogee woman so that we make sure we are educating the entire family I'd like to take a moment and thank one of our sponsors, Ned. Ned makes an incredible magnesium product called Mellow Magnesium. And I first heard about Mellow because I was having trouble getting to sleep, staying asleep. And Mellow Magnesium has helped me do that. Many Americans are actually deficient in magnesium. And this is a mineral that is essential to hundreds of functions in the body. Ned's Mellow Magnesium was designed to address the fundamental deficiencies that come from our modern lives. Mellow Magnesium is a daily super blend. It has three forms of chelated magnesium, has GABA, L-theanine, amino acids, and over 70 trace minerals. For me, it's helped improve my sleep, reduce stress, improve my mood, help with my gut, and potentially even strengthen my immunity. This is a full transparency product. Ned shares all of its third-party lab reports, which I think is amazing. Go to helloned.com. That's H-E-L-L-O-N-E-D.com slash Dr. Lion for 15% off all Ned products. It's critically important. You know, I care about this because I, I care about our world. And I have a three-year-old boy and a five-year-old girl. And I watch them and they are in a private school and I watch them and they come home and I think to myself, who is raising this child and these children to be, again, I care about my boy, I care about my girl. And I want to know how, number one, I can instill habits. So you had mentioned that there are that there are faults in the habits yeah. that these children are indoctrinated in. Yes, ma'am. And if I were to think what and I, my children are very physically active. If I if you were to tell me the top three to five habits that yeah. we need to instill in these children, whether it's the, my little boy, my little girl, and then I want to know that first. And then I want to know the top three to five habits that we need to watch out for, that we need to potentially undo or challenge. Gosh, I love that. Um, so leading by example, you guys leading by example is, no, you, by the way, it doesn't matter if they go to school, if they don't go to school, you are the primary educator in their life, period, end of story. Always have been, always will be, right? You're Kids will do what you do before they do what you say. So it is wildly important that you, your husband, right? Any parents show up and they are the people that they say they are. No hypocrisy, open, honest, moving yourselves forward. So as far as habits for these young people, ultimately what we want to get them to is self-direction, right? You don't want them being 40 and having to live with you. <laughs> right? I mean, you love I mean, them. Right now, I think right now really it sounds cute. great. A hundred percent. And by the way, it always sounds great if you do it right and you have a great relationship, of course. But the reality is you want them to be sovereign individuals too, right? Ultimately, you want them to have the knowledge and the capability to go pour into the world, to go serve other be you know human beings, to go build a life of their own design. And the byproduct of doing that, being active in living with a purpose, the byproduct ends up being joy. Right? It's not chasing joy. We don't chase happiness. No. You chase a purpose, happiness becomes a byproduct. You chase a purpose and happiness becomes a byproduct. That's the way it actually works. Right. So the biggest thing you can do is we want to remain as close as possible to those factory settings. So when we work with these young people, what we're trying to do is we're trying to 
keep factory settings where where they are, where they came, they like they come out with this factory setting. We're trying to keep that. And when we work with the with the adults, we're trying to usually get them back to factories. A lot of times it's addition by subtraction. It's mm-hmm. getting rid of the garbage, right? And so we want to get them back to that. Um, so what do we mean by factory settings? Well, health is a factory setting. You come out, God willing, you know, no, no complications. And I understand there are scenarios. Yes, obviously there's the, there's the one-off kind of things, but you come out as a healthy, capable human being. So we want to maintain that health. You can speak to that better than I can, but real food matters. Activity matters. Sunlight matters. Sleep matters. So building the habit of understanding your physiology and how much that plays into your ability to grow as a human matters. It's one of what we call the meta skills, right? So understanding that matters. By the way, we talk about mental health for our young people obsessively. Well, physical health is the precursor to mental health. Certainly. There is no avoiding that. Certainly. If you say, I want my kid to be mentally healthy, but you're feeding them Mickey D's, they don't have a, a normal sleep time, you're letting them stay inside all day and not get sun, they're not active, they're sitting on, you don't care about their mental health, period. Mm. Right? So that's one of those things. Maintaining curiosity is one of those habits, right? That's why we that's utilize this. Okay. Very much so. So what do kids do? Your three and five year old prime examples right now. Why? How? Can I? How does that? Why? Why is that? Cool. That's awesome. That gets trained out of us in school because school says, give me the right answer. There's one right answer. Give me the right answer. All I care about is answers. Regurgitate an answer. Why does it? Because I said so. Why does it? Because it's on the test. Why does it? School trains you to stop being curious. Curiosity is the natural state of a human. We are wired to want to grow. We understand inherently that growth means life. We have to. The minute we stop growing, the minute we stop learning, we start dying. Whether your body gets buried or not, you've started to die. So maintaining that curiosity, um, the habit of taking on responsibility. When is it too early to start that? Never. Never. What would be an example for my well, three so and five three and five year olds? They're they're gonna come into, you know, they're gonna come into the kitchen sometime. They're gonna be like, Hey mommy, can I help you cook? What do we do as parents? A lot of times, and I'm guilty just when I say this, please understand there's no such thing as a perfect parent. I am far from a perfect parent. No such thing as a perfect kid. There's no such thing as perfection, but the pursuit of perfection should always be the goal, right? So, um, but they come in and they're like, hey, can I help you cook? What do we want to do? No, yes, uh, just, go ahead. That's what we 100%. should be doing. No, no, go ahead. That's what we should be doing is going, yeah, cool. Sounds good. Let's go. What do parents normal? Ah, that's going to take too long. Oh, it's going to get messy. Oh, they're going to break. Oh, gonna, uh, right. And so we squash, we start slowly squashing curiosity, right? We should be going, yeah, awesome. That sounds good. But as they get older, what are the jobs around here they can pick? Is it cleaning up their room? Is it vacuuming is it there is no and you think that that's important so they should be it's doing wildly important and they want to help they want to okay. contribute they find value in that right they get self they self-esteem self-confidence is something that always has to be earned and it's earned by doing things that matter that's the way we're designed it's not earned by somebody telling you you're the best no right it's not earned by you're you're awesome you're you're fantastic and all these affirmations that's great but in their mind their subconscious they need something to attach it to so attaching it to a process of look you are helping others you are being a good human you are providing value you're doing the right thing like that's where self esteem self confidence comes from so we got to give them that responsibility early and often I love that. So far, I have self-directed activity. And that means in my mind that for, for example, my little children, that they should be able to play and do activities where I am not having to show them every little thing to do, that they should be able to entertain themselves and have some kind of self-directed capacity. The other thing that I heard you say was get back to factory settings, meaning, and that actually sounds like that comes from the parent getting them outside early, making sure that they're physically active, uh, providing healthy food, et cetera. The other thing would be, the third thing that you had mentioned was maintaining curiosity. And finally, and I'm sure that there's more, is allowing them the process of responsibility. You bet, early and often. Early. Early and often. My thir- As we speak right now, my 13-year-old is at work. She works like she'll work 20 hours 
this week. What are some of the, and you've been in education for 20, what, 20 plus years? Mm -hmm, about two, yeah, about two decades. Um, congratulations. Yeah, thank you. There, there were two things. So you had mentioned this Socratic method. Mm -hmm. And I would love to hear how important that is, what it is, and should we as parents at home be utilizing it? And even as adults with no children should be thinking about this as a framework for thinking in and of itself. Well, you bet. That's what you're so, this is the framework for thinking. So we talk about, you know, schools say, um, we want to build critical thinkers. That's what they say. It's the cliche is what you're supposed to say. We want to build lifelong learners and critical thinkers. Okay. But the system is designed to do exactly the opposite. Critical thinking means you're thinking about your thinking. Why do I think this? Why do I believe this? Why do I say this? Why do I believe what I, what I say I believe? Am I emotionally enough in control to take a look at other evidence and weigh it and consider it and then make a, an educated decision and go, this is the best evidence that I have right now. And so I'm gonna go, that's where we ultimately wanna get. But again, maintaining curiosity is the precursor to all of that. So the Socratic method at its most basic form is that, well, why, why, why? And taking that down to the root of the foundation of whatever it is that you're questioning, right? Why does the human body respond well to sunlight? Why, what would happen if the sun doesn't come out? What would happen if I lived in Seattle and I never saw the sun? How does that impact my body? Like anytime we're questioning and just going down, that's essentially a precursor to, to, to the Socratic method. More intentionally, what I like to do with my kids and what we do on our campuses is we'll do a more tactical uh, kind of a Socratic approach where we'll utilize uh, books, stories, uh, movies, uh, the lives of people we know and go, okay, well, now you're them. Now you're this person. You're the protagonist in this scenario. You've got option A, you've got option B. What are you going to pick and why? And start getting the reps in on, okay, I would make this decision in this kind of scenario because my values determine that I go this way and the ripple effect would be, right? So there's an element of who am I and what happens if I make this decision? And you've got to weigh both of those. When you start getting really good, what you do is you start having scenarios where it's like option A, option B, both equally great but they're very different and you have to defend one even though your answer is right here or both equally suck. <laughs> and you've got to pick one because the answer is really in the middle, but you got to pick one and you got to defend it. Why? It makes you think about your thinking. And so really all of it, the root of all of it is just allowing for questions and going, okay, what if, what if, without having to even force a predetermined answer. Let's talk through making these decisions. You get reps. What happens when you go to the gym? You get reps at movements. So you get better. Yes, you get stronger, but there's a neurological adaptation. There's Certainly. all, right? So you do the repetitions. All we're doing is doing the repetitions on thinking and making decisions. Those are things that life always demands. And you're learning how to control your emotions throughout the whole thing, right? You're learning how to be effective. You're learning how to see patterns more quickly. So we need to have those conversations with our kids. So it, it's the way, that's the way we're designed. Fascinating. And it's, it's not, it's never too early oh, to, to start. So even, you know, we read stories to the kids and we read these ninja books and these ninja books talk about hard work. They talk about making mistakes. And I'm going to take it up a notch as a parent and begin to ask them, what would you do if you were this hardworking ninja? How would you respond yeah. to this? I, I really, I really can appreciate that. What about this idea of so this is really framed around the conversation of sovereignty of, of the, and the way I interpret that is being in control physically and mentally of your body and the direction of your life. Would you agree with? Very much, very much so. And, and that, by the way, came from, um, gosh, man, I was probably 10, 12 years into working in schools, was on the precipice of, of really getting to the point where I was kind of like, you know what? I've got to do something different, not just for these heroes that I'm serving, these young people. I can't look myself in the mirror anymore, right? And do what I'm doing here because I don't believe I'm perpetuating real growth. And I sure as hell am not going to do this for my own children, right? So I got to that point where it's like, I've got to figure something out. But it was right about at that point where I talked to a gentleman, some of the listeners may know him, named Seth Godin. And Seth is a, is a brilliant human being. And Seth asked me a question that I'd never been asked 
in all my years in school. He said, what should education be for? And I went, oh my gosh. I've actually never been asked that question, right? I love those questions. I I love those And it's so simple. It's so simple. It's like, what should education be for? And so I had to sit and think about it. Like, man, what should it be for? Because it's a wildly personal endeavor. It always is, right? It has to be because it's got to be based on your circle. It's got to be based on your goals. It's got to be based on your life and where you are now and where you want to go. It's got to be based on your inherent abilities and loves and likes and dislikes. It's got to be based on that. Part of the root of education, that word educare is to draw out. It's got to draw out something that is unique to you. I'm really good at things that you're really bad at. You're really good at things that I'm really bad at. That's great. That's awesome. Mm. Let's celebrate that. Right? So how do we draw out the best and you draw out the best in me? And then we go, okay, is there a way for us to work together on these things? Right? Like that's how it works, but it's also wildly personal to your scenario. Um, We live on a farm now in North Carolina. I'm a city kid. I'm a city kid from the Bay Area, man. I I love it. I don't know anything about farms, right? (laughs) My wife's city kid from the Bay Area. She didn't know anything about farms. Now we live for two years. We live at the top of a mountain on a farm. We got a processing facility on site. We're raising animals. We're processing animals. We got thousands of trees. Tree goes down, takes out the electric fence. Guess what? I have to be able to self-educate on. I got to figure out how to fix some freaking electric fence and get out there and lumberjack. And that's, but I am confident in my ability to learn what I need to learn when I need to learn it. So that's what education is. So Seth asked me that question. He's like, what should education be for? And that's ultimately what I got to is it's, well, it's for sovereignty. It is to be able to be the person that I need to be and be the person that I want to be. Those aren't the same, but I need to be able to do both. And I need to be able to do both of those when it needs to happen. And then I, gosh, extra level. What if I can help other people do the same thing? What if I can help my kids do the same thing for themselves? What if I can help, right? Then it's now it's leadership too. So yeah, that's when I say sovereignty, that's where that all came from. You'd mentioned that you were in education for a very long period of time. Was there a moment, because it's unusual, I think many of us don't question the educational system. Was there a moment that you just said, you know, we're doing this wrong? Um, it's, that's a, it's a great question. Uh, there were many, (laughs) there were many, but there were specific defining moments, you know, for sure. Um, I was working with a, a a brilliant, brilliant young man. Um, he's about 13, 14 years old, brilliant young man. And we were in kind of a gang land sort of area of of California and he was being raised in in a gang. Um, his family, parents were both in the gang and he was so, um, but he's brilliant. And so cool and so funny, so freaking smart, so freaking capable. Like, love this kid in a horrible environment, you know, and he's being taught when he goes home. It's not homework. No, it's you get out and you get out and go start slinging, right? And I'm pouring into this young man, making sure I can develop a relationship. There was, a, you know, multiple relationships I'm trying to develop and I'm talking to him about. So I've got him in a class. And I'm like, dude, I don't want you. I don't. You don't have to do homework. I'm not, I'm not going to send this homework. Here's what I want to do though. Let's talk about what you're going to, let's talk about seeing how you can develop some of these other habits. You're really talented here. You're really interested in this. Like what if instead of homework for my class, what if you just, I want you to go down. YouTube was a new thing, you know? And so it's like, what if you go down this YouTube thing and you start looking up videos around this? And what if we start, start, start start having these conversations and I get brought in and it's like, no, he's got to, you can't give him an A for that. He's got to do the homework. He's got to do like everybody else. Like he needs algebra. I'm like, no, he doesn't need out. Like that's not what he needs. That's not what he needs. He needs guidance. He needs mentorship. And it's like, oh my God, like how, every single human here, good parents, bad, they all need that. But the system is not designed for that. It is a one size fits all. So then I start going, okay, well, would a doctor be like, hey, by the way, when you're five, I need you to take this medication. And that's everybody across the board. When you're six, I want you to take this medication. Everybody across the board. It's uh, What? Nobody would do that. And by the way, you're allowed to go to the grocery store. You can only go to six aisles and you got to go to the same six aisles and that's it. And that's all you can pull standard across the board. Mm-hmm. What? Nobody would go for that. But we've been convinced that schooling should should look like that. All right. So it was really dealing with him where I started going, okay, how did the system come to be in the first place? And I started diving into the work of guys like Ivan Illich and John Taylor Gatto. And I started looking at the history of schooling and why we brought schooling over here from Prussia and what it was designed to do. It wasn't designed to build thriving humans. What was it designed to do? It was designed to get obedience. It was designed by the Prussian military to get obedient soldiers. That's where school came from? That's where the schooling model, as we know it, was essentially designed 
for that was brought over here by the industrialists who then went, okay, well, this we can take advantage of this. We want a nation of, of workers for our factories. So Rockefeller poured in what was the equivalent of about $1.3 billion at the time. He said, I want a nation of workers, not a nation of thinkers. They said, what are you going to teach the kids then? He says, I'm going to teach them much about nothing. Basically, I'm going to waste their time for all of these years. I'm going to keep them out of, uh, you know, out of work. Uh, I'm going to pull them out. People think it was like a child labor law thing. Like it was an issue like, oh my God, all these factories and the kids were, no, the kids, kids want to work. They want to get at it. But what was happening is they're going in and they're, they're wanting to innovate and they're wanting to change things. And then once it was like, no, let's get them out of here. Let's go make them docile for, you know, for these 12 years and get them in the habit of just listening to what we want them to do like Pavlov's dog, ring a bell, you know, here we go. Um, so I started seeing that and I'm like, okay, cool. Well, I can't perpetuate this, right? I can't do that. So that was one of the moments, but I naively went from public to private because private doesn't have to follow the same state guidelines. So I went, okay, they're probably going to do things differently. Wrong, right? They're afraid of, of upsetting the apple cart. So they're going to design their system to be the exact same. It's going to look exactly the same. Most private schools look just like the public schools. They're afraid to do something different. Everybody expects that, but they just, they, they expect it to look the same, but they expect, you know, the demographic to be different or the people to be better or, you know, the academia to be more rigorous because they've been trained to believe that's what they want. So go over to private schools. I'm like, ah, okay, this is, I'm struggling here too. So the next moment was after a few years running these private schools was sitting in my car at the end of a workday reading Seth Godin's Stop Stealing Dreams. It just confirmed everything I already knew, but it gave me the kind of the, the the cojones to go, all right, my oldest is about ready for school age. I just, I can't and I won't. So the next day I went back into the office and I said, hey, I'm going to finish out this year and then I'm done. I have to go create something else. I got, I don't know how I'm going to do that, but I got to go create something that my kids can go to. I have to. Because you wanted to build a world of thinkers, not workers. Have to, have to, like have to can't look at myself in the mirror if I'm not trying. We've got a family contract uh, in our house. It's a it's the Beaudreaux family rules, right? And what it is, is something that we can all hold each other accountable to. Um, one of those rules is no complaining. Fix it. If it is something worth pointing a finger at and going, hey, somebody should, something needs to change, somebody should do this, somebody should, then it's your responsibility to do it. Otherwise, shush. Otherwise, be quiet. And this was something that I was able to complain about <laughs> ad nauseum. So I needed to do something else. Thank you to Mudwater for sponsoring this episode of the show. Mudwater has come and swooped in to replace my afternoon coffee, and I'm so grateful it did. Mudwater is a healthy alternative to coffee, and it tastes incredible. It has this kind of chai cacao flavor. It's essentially hot chocolate for adults with a hint of caffeine, no jitters. It also has cordycep mushrooms in it. This helps promote natural energy. It has chaga and reishi, which has been shown to help support a healthy immune system. Non-GMO, gluten-free, USDA certified organic. It is an amazing product if you want to replace your afternoon coffee. And do I dare say, if you wanted to replace your morning coffee, this is a delicious way to do it. You can try Mud Water now for 29 bucks. That's less than a dollar a cup a day when you go to mudwater.com. That's M U D W T R.com slash Dr. Lion. I was going to ask you should one of my questions here on as I was thinking about this, should we have a family ethos? And, and I want to know about how we develop and what would be an example of a family ethos versus family rules. For example, in, my, in, in our little family, it's always be respectful to mommy and daddy. You always tell the truth. They're very basic. Yeah. No hitting, yeah. no grabbing yep. things. Yep. There are no secrets. Yep. We have certain, you know, we just have a handful of things which ultimately I believe will evolve to. Um, I'm getting out my, my picture right now. <laughs> Sorry, you keep going. I'm getting uh, out the picture to will, show you. Yes, ultimately will be to, and by the way, I can see it because I have special magic eye drops, right, Matt? Yeah. My producer is here. Um, <laughs> That's right. Is that 
Obviously, they have to be age appropriate so my kids can understand it. But our idea is how do we build in a family ethos that then continues to evolve with the family? And, and at what age and how does it look? Is it an ethos versus family rules? Is this something that is repeated every day? Is This is what we do before we sit down for dinner. What are some ways that we can be very effective to get the end result, which is confident, capable children, and also in even ourselves becoming more structured and disciplined as humans. So good, man. This is all the right questions. So our family ethos, our family rules, it's one and the same, right? That's it is the okay. thing that we call the family rules because it looks it looks cool on a on a plaque, right? And so I'm just showing you someone to go through and actually show you what we have there. But like that we're, is we're, we're gonna be getting this that. Is I'm gonna on, put that in today. Dang right. We're gonna we're gonna put it in there. That is it is hanging one. on the wall in our house in the most prominent area so that we all see it and let me let me just re hear a revisit couple. That. I'd so, love to hear a couple. So uh, I'll, it's 11 rules. I'll go, so Let's it's hear. be honest and that starts with yourself. And so everything's got a little bit of a caveat in there. So be honest, starting with yourself, which means, yeah, we're gonna be on, we're not gonna lie to each other ever. We're not gonna lie to anybody else. And most importantly, we're not gonna lie to ourselves. Um, so it's, you know, it's a, it's a, a, a nod to self-awareness. So be honest, be a copycat. And what that means is you've got people who are doing things you wanna do. They are impacting the world in ways that you wanna impact the world. So what are the patterns of success? You never wanna be anybody else. You don't wanna to try to be anybody else, but you can look to amazing people and go, okay, what is it about what they're doing that really resonates with me and why? And how do I implement that in, in my own life, right? So being a copycat, being an emotional ninja, emotions are great, they're, they're, but they're indicators that something else needs to happen. So we wanna acknowledge them, we wanna accept them, but then we wanna go, okay, well, what is it trying to tell me and how do I go forward, right? How do I not be controlled by them? So being an emotional ninja, be the hardest worker in the room, be the kindest person in the room, no complaining, fix it, think because most people won't, discipline equals freedom, thank you Jocko, memento mori, right, I mean, remember that you are, this right ends, like remember death, it's not a fascination with death, it's an obsession with life, with actually living, remember you are one day closer today to being done, so let's make today count. Um, you are personally responsible, meaning it is your job to do what needs to be done and doing the right thing is always the right thing. So those are the 11 in our house. Those were uh, they generated from a conversation. Um, my wife and I and our two little girls, our young man was, I think he's only one at the time, so he didn't have any input on it. Um, but It'd be impressive uh, if he yeah, did. It would be, huh? 100%. Um, but we, we sat down, had a conversation and go, hey, how do we want to show up in the world? Like, what does a good person look like? Um, and we, the kids will, they know. Oh, you got to be nice to people. Okay, cool. What does that mean? How does that, you know, like, what does that actually look like, right? So we have this, this conversation. We get a general idea of what we want to put on there. And we're allowed to make that, you know, malleable. We're allowed to make that something that can continuously adapt over time. That, that's fine. It's not it's something that's like set in stone. It's not the Ten Commandments. It's this is how we believe we should show up and, and look at the world. So we put that, we put that up. We have the definitions for us as a family. What, a, what does that mean? How does that actually look? But the important thing is, one, that you revisit it. So that is a weekly conversation. It is a weekly family meeting um, for us, right? Just a weekly meeting of just going, hey, how are we doing? How are we showing up on these? Are we doing the things we say we're, you know, we... Uh, want to do? Are we showing up the way that we say we want to show up? We have those meetings. Is there any um, one of those that we need to focus on more this week that we're missing? I, I right? like that it's weekly as opposed to the pressure of daily. Yep. I think, that's a, that, I think yep. that's a great idea. And, we're gonna and at this point, that. it's just a quick check-in too, right? Because they all know what everything is. So it's just a quick check-in. It, it's all of that. But where it gets to be really, really powerful, mom and dad can hold each other accountable to these Mom and dad can hold the kids accountable. Kids can hold each other accountable. Where it's really powerful is when the kids hold the parents accountable. When my son goes, dad, you kind of sound like you're complaining on something right now. Do you have a solution? <laughs> and he says it respectfully. And then I go, hmm, you're right. Okay, let me see. Do I want to put a solution to this? Or do I want to just be quiet? Then he knows that our relation, like he can trust me, right? We've got our relationship that he can trust what dad says. He knows that what we have there in this family value, that it, it like, it, they mean it. 
Like that's real. That's really how we got to show up. And they watch mom and dad show up like that in the world. So that is how they decide to show up because again, they'll do what you do before they do what you say. So they, are you the people you want them to be? Hmm. Where does discipline come in? I, I think that discipline is very controversial, whether it's yelling, speaking, et cetera. Uh, where does discipline play a role in all of this early on yeah. and then yeah. as they become young men yeah, and young young girls? It, so we reframe the word. People ask me all the time when they meet my kids, how do you discipline them? Oh my gosh, they're so well, like they're so well behaved, right? But they're also, they can have conversations and they're articulate and they're, you know, they, they're clearly very comfortable um, in any scenario and clearly very comfortable around adults and they're comfortable leading and they're like, how did you discipline them? And what they're asking is, did you yell at them? Did you not yell at them? Did you do the thing where it's like, oh, okay, honey, anything you want, right? And just like the whole laissez-faire, like, did you, were you super like strict authority? Mm -hmm. like, how, what did you do? What did you do? None of that. We taught them to be disciplined humans. That's a different thing. You don't have to discipline them. You teach them how to be disciplined by being disciplined. So what does that look like in our house? It's all of those family values, um, but it is always pointing toward, and it's not compromising. Like we point towards the ideal. We talk about how to uh, handle a certain scenario. What is the right thing to do? And anytime we see them doing the right thing, we go over and above, especially foundation of those first five years, like overboard going, yes. Like we praise them inspirationally. So my son, you know, we go outside, we got and, and taking care of animals and he goes over and he pulls the gate back and lets his sisters and his mom go first, right? Dude, I, I will not miss a time and I will not miss a time when I see him doing that. You are a good man. That is what a good man does. Like that's like, I will make sure he knows that's the thing. So what happens now? Anytime we go anywhere, my son is notorious for he will, if there, he will hold the door open for everybody, especially if it's women or girls or children. He won't miss it. And every time I'm like, I will, I, I literally, like when he does that, I bow to him. I just tell him, thank you. I'm like, dude, that's, that's it. Like, that's the man right there. Right. I will praise inspirationally. Anytime they do, anytime they go up and they're just like, Hey, here, my name's, you know, so-and-so nice to meet you. I took him to the side. That's it. That's how, that's how oh, a leader so acts, good. right? That's how a leader acts right there. Exactly what you just did to keep doing that, right? So we set the standard. We praise them inspirationally every time they hit it, especially for those first five years. And then again, five to eight is kind of the next developmental range. And you give them a little extra responsibility. Praise it, praise it, praise it. When they miss the mark, because they will. Especially, for example, within that three to five, what what are you doing there? Because they are off the rails. They're, but they don't have to be off the rails in every scenario, right? Oh, my kid, dude, my three-year-old is, uh, when he was, or my eight-year-old, when he was three, dude, he was a, he is your stereotypical, like, dude just wants to be in a tree or fighting something. Yes, yes. Like, let's fight. Uh, great, man. Let's do it. Let's do it all day long until it's time to not. We have this weird thing where it's like, we can't, ah, but they just want to cool. But they also are really smart beings and they will understand when you say, Hey, that's awesome. Like, I want you to be able to do this. Here's when we don't do it. When we go into a restaurant, this is how we behave. Watch this. Let's make a game out of this. Like watch daddy. Love you to copy this. Me, I'm learning right? so much. You just, you're so intentional much. and they will just gravitate towards it. I love one of the things Jordan Peterson talks about. He says, your job up until they're five years old is to make them somebody worth being around. Because if you make it to where nobody wants to be around them, you're actually setting them up for failure. Nobody wants them to be around anymore. That sucks. They're going to treat them differently. They're not going to invite them to things. They're not going to have as many opportunities to grow as a human. So manners still matter. Right. I want my young man to be a white and he's out at American top team now training, you know, a couple of days a week. He's doing Ninja Warrior like he's Incredible. out. My, my wife sends me a picture this morning and he's way up in this freaking tree in the pasture. Like he's doing all the things that a young man should be able to have the opportunity to do. But somebody comes over to the house. He knows he goes over. He shakes their hand. Hi, I'm Loudon. Nice to meet you. Because that's the right thing. He doesn't have to know why yet. He doesn't have to yet. He just needs to know that that's what we do. And basically, it's continue to praise the good, put boundaries on the bad. Put boundaries on the bad. And when right. they are throwing, and, and, I, and I understand that this is a very specific question, but I also think that it translates to us as adults. 
when they are absolutely throwing a fit about not being able to have candy in the morning, for example, that this happened this morning. And I just said, you know what? I, yeah, that's really upsetting that you can't have it. But here's when you can't, when you can have it, you can have it this afternoon. Yeah. And, you know, they just full on meltdown, but they have to be able to learn how to control their emotion in in that. A hundred percent they in do. In that way. hundred percent they do. And, and we'll speak to them very, like, we have this weird thing that kids are, um, this, this concept in our minds that kids are, uh, like they're learning to be people. They're people. <laughs> they just, they just got less experience than we do, right? They they're people. Less experience. So we can talk to them and say, you know what? You're kind of throwing a temper tantrum. You don't ever see mom and dad do this. And I'm not going to honor that. We have a, you know, in, in our house, there's freedoms, but freedoms come with responsibility. There's responsibility first. Right now, the responsibility you're taking on is throwing a temper tantrum. There is no reward on the other end of that. So you can do that all you want, but I want you to understand what you're throwing a temper tantrum for. You're automatically not going to get it now because yeah. there's a temper tantrum. If you would come up and ask me calmly, then we could have a discussion about it, right? I promise if you have those conversations a few times and you're consistent with your message, sometimes they get the temper tantrum and they get what they want. Sometimes the temper tantrum doesn't get what they want. They're going to test your, they're going to test you. Like, which one do you actually mean mom and dad? Yeah. Because I'm not, you're not being consistent. If you're consistent on it, it won't take more than a couple and they won't throw temper tantrums anymore, assuming factory settings are still solid, right? So they're able to get out and get exercise. They're able to be fit like they're not getting fed a bunch of garbage. They're not sitting down and looking at screens all day and they're not doing all these things that make it squirrely. You do all those things, you're going to have more, more temper tantrums. And how would that translate to an adult who has already raised themselves and they don't have children, but they want to get back to some of their factory settings. Mm, that's a really good, well, a lot of your work that you do is around that, right? I mean, a lot of that, but it's harder to get an adult to do it. I mean, that's really the issue here is, um, one of my favorite quotes, Frederick Douglass said, it is easier to build strong children than fix broken men. It is. I love that. It is easier to build bro strong children than fix, than fix broken, men. broken men. Yep. And that's, and of course that applies to men and women. It is that those are the habits that you have developed for the long, you know, the long haul. So it is um, really getting to where you're, you're building new habits. It's, it's an, it's a, essentially a neural, entire like neurological reprogramming that we have to, and this is what we're doing with our men and our women. I mean, does the physical come first and the phys or the, the mental, um, we, we do it simultaneously. Uh, we really do. We don't necessarily, and I've seen it work both ways where, you know, somebody really dives into the mental and that goes, okay, so the mental, I get it now. So now I'm going to tackle the physical because I was too scared to do it. I've also seen it work the other way where somebody's like, okay, the physical is giving me the confidence and the clarity to go ahead and go mental. You know, a, a lot of our uh, uh, good friends in this space, you know, are very much around like, hey, fitness is the gateway drug to the mental side. And I've definitely seen that be the case, but I have seen it be the case where people go, okay, let me actually start to redefine what we said earlier right? Socrates says the beginning of wisdom is the definition of terms. We have our men and women define what it looks like to show up as the husband or the wife or the person at work or the mom or the dad um, or the person at the gym. Like who do you actually show up as? What is that ideal person? Plato had this concept of uh, what he called the forms. And it was essentially what does the ideal me look like in each one of these scenarios? Because Matt sitting here talking to Gabby is very, this is, I'm Matt. This is very much me. This is very much hundred percent me, but it's a different relationship than when I'm hundred percent showing up as the husband, right? Inherently. And as the dad, and as, you know, if I'm on a stage and speaking to 5,000 people or am I, all of those are me, but they're different versions of me. So we define those ideals and go, what does that person do? How does that person speak? How does that person dress? How does that person act? How does that person treat other people? How does that person think? Like, let's define, it doesn't mean you're doing it yet. It just means let's define that, right? Who are the patterns? That, uh, who are the other people this person follows to get the patterns of how to, but we start to neurologically reprogram and then we start to go, okay, and now what are, what are the habits around that? 
Like, what does that look like? What does the schedule look like around that? Bad habits don't go away just because you want them to go away. They actually have to be replaced. Wait, they don't? <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. So so you actually have to replace it with something better. You have to replace it with something that moves you forward. So we're walking our men and women through that to get them back to those factory settings. That's That must be very, very rewarding. Very much so. It's also frustrating as hell when they don't do it, right? Like when you see somebody that you're like, oh my gosh, I see, I see who you are and I see who you can be. Like I, oh my, if you would just believe in yourself as much as we believe in you, oh my gosh, you've got all the tools, you've got it right here, but they get sucked back into the old version. They get sucked. That's frustrating as well. Yeah. And I, I have a sense of what I think your answer is going to be, but I, you know, I have concerns about the young women. There's certain things that I swear I feel like as if they make bad choices. And I, again, I don't know if this is a developmental thing yeah. where it seems as if young women, and I say young women because again, I'm a physician, I see behind the scenes on, uh, I'm, it is a privilege, right? It is a privilege sure. to see behind the scenes on the inner For workings sure. of people and families. And it seems as if young women struggle with this self-worth. And when they struggle with this self-worth, it leads them vulnerable to exploitation, physical, sexual exploitation. And especially now with Twitter, Instagram, the, the social media, a lot more predators, and also bad young relationships or even physical assault. I mean, there's, is there, number one, is this an age type of thing that maybe when young women hit their teenage years or to through their 20s that they it's a natural thing to question worth or is this something that we can address yeah. and if there is a, a young woman or even adult listening can they go back and and address that yeah that's a really good question it's, a, it's an important question um it, it's an it's a yes and as far as the answer is it normal to start to quite it, it is it's normal to be able to and that's not even just a young woman thing but it, it very much um very much a dominant uh, mental state as they get into kind of the 12 13 year old range because there's an extra level of brain jump that we talk about like the uh, your brain's not fully developed till you're 25 right like we talk about that all the time. and yes true very much so but there's a huge brain jump that happens at eight another one that happens at 12 another ones that happens at around 16 right and so that's kind of a blanket statement but it's roughly right around that, that time so um young ladies you get throttled at 12 or 13 because your brain jumps you can start to now see patterns more clearly you can start to think more uh, in an abstract fashion you can start to answer the kind of the what ifs like it starts to actually make more sense you start questioning the world around you you start questioning where you fit in that place right you start having all those questions so the brain jump happens and then oh hey by the way here's a rush of hormones too and now you're going through puberty and now your body's changing and you're like what the hell is going right so you just turn into this hot hot mess of a human so how important is it that we make sure that they've got relationships that have been established if we can now we'll talk about having to go backwards as well but some of the some of the things that i've i've heard quite a bit is like oh just wait man you got you got a teenager right just wait what are you going to do when she's a teenager what am i going to do i'm going to make sure that the first 12 years of her life i have been extraordinarily impactful and have been extraordinarily close to her so that she knows. So guess what happened when she turned 13? <gasps> nothing, right? It was <laughs> I was like waiting on the edge of my seat. Nothing, what happened? Dude, nothing different, <laughs> nothing. Because we have a great relationship because it's always open because, you know, when she started her, when she just started, just started her cycle and it was like, oh, hey, by the way, yeah, this started. Um, and we're like, all right, cool, man. What do you need? You know, whatever. And she's like, yeah, you know, I'm good. I understand, you know, that. and it was just like, all right, cool. It was like, she was saying, I'm going to go make a sandwich. Like it was like, because we have that relationship established already and we make sure that it's attractive to get older we've made it very unattractive no. to be an adult because why well adults seem like they're miserable they seem like they hate their life they seem like they hate their job they seem like they're always arguing with somebody over something they seem like they're always pointing the finger over here and going oh this sucks this sucks this sucks we have made it very unattractive for them to want to grow and be adults and so then they're like, oh, well, that sounds awful. 
And then I look over here at the news and the news is saying that the whole world sucks. And then I get on social media and that's giving me a false sense of, of, you know, what somebody does to get value and I'm going to get the light. So we're, we're overloading them with all this garbage, right? So we make it attractive to be an adult, meaning my wife is a really freaking awesome human. And the people that we bring into our lives that come over to our house that we will engage with, that we will point, you know, our finger to as, as, as my daughter's inner voice stops just being mom and dad's voice. And she's now developmentally inherently looking and going, what other voices are out there? We go, hey, look, here's some other great voices. Here's some other people to listen to. Here's a great book to read. Here's a great, right? We've got that established. So she's seeing examples of other people but they're examples that fall in line with that family ethos. We're making it attractive to grow. It's, we're making it okay to question. We're making it okay to change. We're making all of that available to her. We're being very specific and we're keeping the distractions away. She's not at a, a conveyor belt school where she's got the influence of a bunch of other people who I, I don't know where, they, and that's not sheltering, by the way. No, it's that taking is taking control. Taking of, control yeah. during those developmental years yeah. to set a really strong foundation so that she becomes a woman who then can see evil when evil is presented or something ridiculous when it's presented, right? We're, we're giving her that foundation. So she's not exposed to that. She doesn't have social media. She's not going to have social media. You do that as soon as you want your kid's childhood to end. Like that's not happening for us, right? So um, it's all those things. I, I absolutely agree with you. This. This is certainly such an enlightening conversation. The world needs more of you. I have so much respect for what you and some of your teammates are doing. Just extraordinarily high amount of respect. Thank you for that. And, and, I, and I want, there's a whole lot of really good humans out there, right? And there's a whole lot. So what you're doing, you're talking about this, this changes, this changes family bloodlines right here. I'm understanding the lineage. How, this is the, the lineage. Goal. This, this is, is the it, goal. right? With the, with the health, this is part of educate. You're educating the population too. And all we're doing is teaming up with people, all the people that are coming to us and they're now launching campuses in their community. They're teaming with us on this. All the guest mentors that show up, they're teaming with us on this. There are so many, the media will tell you otherwise. But the reality is you look around, there are so many amazing humans who want to perpetuate this solid message for the next generation. And we're working together to do this. So we just need to put a highlight on more of them, man. Well, we're doing it. We're doing it. Thank you to Inside Tracker for sponsoring this episode of the show. I will never be done talking about the importance of understanding your blood work and knowing your own biomarkers. This is a necessity, and Inside Tracker makes it so easy to do. We all know that we face different insults in our own life, whether we are up too late or we are exposed to foods that might be less than ideal. There are many reasons as to why people age differently. It is your responsibility to know how you are doing that. And that is why I love Inside Tracker. You can go to their website. They make it super easy. There's a whole bunch of different programs that you can purchase to look at biomarkers. It also analyzes your blood, DNA, fitness tracking data. You can get it directly. There are markers like ApoB and a full CBC blood count and insulin and thyroid, you name it. If it's meaningful, they have it. Go to insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lion. You'll get 20% off, which is very generous. That's insidetracker.com slash Dr. Lion. What are some of the physical necessities that every family should be able to do for just what are the capacities? For example, should everyone be able to defend themselves? Should what are the things that we have to think about? You know, I in my spare time, I love weapons. Yeah. I, I know. Yeah. And, and I've really struggled with, yeah. is that something private? Do I share that with people? Do I not? And I came to this conclusion that the more open and transparent that I can be, yeah. the better it's going to be yeah. for the people that are even interested in what I have to say. And, and I'll tell you exa exactly why I do that. I love weapons training. Number one, yes, it's fun. But number two, I find it a necessity. 
I need to be able to protect my family. Okay. Even though I'm married to a, yep. stud. a, a stud seal, yep. I want to be able to d- depend on myself should the situation ever arise. And my children should be able to know if there is an emergency, we have a game plan, we have a code word, we practice, we know how we're getting out of the house, how we're getting in the car, how should a situation arise? These are physical skills. How long is it going to take us to get out of the house or into the car, et cetera? And, um, and by the way, I got criticized for saying the word et cetera. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you guys are jerks. That's but, uh, <laughs> totally on uh, That's awesome. Oh, that's funny. What should we as parents, as adults, mm-hmm. and the level to which our children should be trained. What should physically we be capable of doing? That's that's a really good, it's a really good question. And there's the physical side and there's just all this, what we're talking about is these meta skills in general. So we emphasize meta skills on all of, in all of our programs, on all of our campuses, a meta skill being something that always matters and always will essentially, right? So, um, you know, when I ask and people are like, well, of course, you know, what is that? Why isn't schools addressing that too? I'm like, okay, really? So 2040, this is 2024. We're, we're talking right now, right? So in 2040, what is the, uh, you know, what's the job that's in highest demand? I don't know. Of course you don't. There's no way to know that. I don't know either. So what will matter? Well, their physical health is going to matter, right? Their ability to, to, uh, you know, take care of their own physical health, to understand their physiology, to understand how to, um, you know, uh, gain muscle mass and understand how to get lean if they need to understand how to avoid, you know, illness and understand how to take care of injuries and understand like all of those things are always going to matter. So that's going to matter. How about taking care of somebody else who gets injured and, and, you know, emergency preparedness. So they need to understand what that looks like. How about defending themselves? You bet. Take it a step forward. If we're really talking sovereignty, does everybody just go to the grocery store to get food? What happens if the grocery store shuts down? What happens if 2020 happens all over again and stores shut down and now you've got to figure out how to grow some food for yourself? Do you know how to do that? What if a grid shuts down and now you no longer have, um, you know, I think Tim said something the other day where it's like an estimated, um, you know, if power was to be eradicated from the United States within one year, 90% of the population would be dead. Okay. So not in a fear-based mentality, but what if that happens? Are you good? Can you survive? Can you grow your own food? Everybody, no, oh, we'll I just, can definitely dude, not we'll just, grow my own we'll food. We'll just get off the earth. I can't keep my woods, plants man. alive too. Yeah, so, so like that, so, so let's, you know, let's talk about like, should we be able to do that? Should we be able to grow and harvest our own food? Should we be able to live without some of the modern common, you know, comforts? Would we be able to live without electricity? Should we, do we, can we live without, um, you know, having cell service? Can we live without being able to have transportation somewhere? Can we live without communication? Without, can we do all those things? I think those are important questions to ask. And, and it's not that, oh my gosh, if I can't do that, you're going to die in the next year. But no, but how prepared are you for any given scenario? That's education. By the way, even if, okay, grid doesn't go down and, and, um, everything's going well there, but all of a sudden, um, everybody realizes that the Fed has been screwing us this entire time and money goes away and now it's a digital, you know, sort of cool, cool. What are you going to do with that? How prepared are you? For that? Do you understand how money works? Are you actually protected? Or are you just going, uh, I don't know, I was told to just go to work for 30 years, throw things in a 401k. Okay, cool. What happens when the market crashes? What are you going to do? Every single bit of this goes beyond just physical. It's, this is just preparedness in, in general. general. Right? In general. In general. And again, then can on the physical side, can you maintain health? Can you protect yourself if somebody attack, you know, was to come and attack you or try to take your stuff? Like all of those things matter. And to be clear, all of you it. believe it matters. Always. And this should be something that we should be educated on. A hundred percent. We have to educate ourselves on that and bring our families through that. It's our moral. It's not even a, this sounds cool. It's our moral obligation. It's our moral obligation if we are taking care of, of our young people to the best of our ability to give them as sovereign as a a scenario as humanly possible. And again, you can extend it outside the physical. You should be able to understand how to generate income. Like what does it mean to build my, you're you're just relying on somebody else, right? How many people got stuck in a bad situation when they're like, ah, gosh, I really don't want to take the jab, ah, but I'm being forced to, ah, if I don't do it, I'm going to lose my job. You're not sovereign. Because somebody can take it away from you. 
with your help, uh, people are, are going to be able to be capable and our next generation is going to be better. And I want to circle back to the, the program, the Apogee. I want to talk about what that word means and very specifically the kinds of children entering the program. Is this available to everybody? Do they share characteristics or demographics? Are there trends? Again, so cool. I know that that, that was no, a lot it. of questions. I love but... it. Great questions. Um, so apogee means the uh, the highest point or the culmination of something. So we we take it um, like you're you know climbing a mountain and you're getting to the top of that and you're getting to the apogee of that mountain. And it's not to mean that you've arrived because once you get there, then what's you know your viewpoint is now there's a bunch of other mountains to climb, right? And so, but the apogee is getting to the highest point of something. Like I said, perfection is not possible, and we always say this in our organization: perfection is not possible but it remains the standard, right? We can always work towards it. Not possible, but it remains the standard. There's always growth. So you can always continue to move closer and closer and closer to the apogee of any of these meta skills that we're talking about. So within the the program, we tend to have people um, who, and this is people over, like the young men are, are usually being signed up, obviously by their parents, um, you know, the men, the women, we tend to have people who lean towards an understanding of personal responsibility matters. They're leaning into this idea of, I don't want the government to have to take care of me on everything. I don't want to live 30 years in a cubicle. I don't want to have that pen that maybe I gave away or maybe I didn't even know I gave away. I don't want somebody else writing my story for the rest of my life. They tend to have that general belief and that tends to, you know, people want to make everything political and it tends to be on a more of a quote unquote conservative side, I guess. But we have people from all backgrounds. We have conservatives. We have people who are, you know, we have people on the right. We have people on the left. We have people who are very much down the center. When it comes to politics, we have people who um, come from faith-based homes. We have people who come from non-faith-based homes. We have people like we ha we see the full game. We have, you know, special operators. We have Olympic athletes. We have guys who are working three jobs in trades just to make the ends meet. We've got literally you know, everything in between. But that's what it comes down to is we have a shared code, a shared set of values. It's really that like Bushido code of honor and loyalty and commitment and politeness and, um, you know, living towards a purpose. And like, that is what we all agree on. And then everything else is a general roadmap to see where are we sovereign? Where are we not? Where do we still have room to grow? Where do we not? Like, that's the whole thing. Now, accessibility is something that we're really, really, um, focused on. So the programs themselves from the virtual standpoint are stupidly wildly affordable on purpose. Um, we've had a number of people be like, Hey, that's dumb. Like you should actually make that more expensive for like what you're doing. You're actually going to kill. So we get that. Um, but again, we're, we're playing this longer tail game and we're wanting to go wide, especially with all these campuses. And we're going to have live events in every state to kick off all of these campuses launching. And we want to get, you know, 500 campuses just here in the U.S. alone. Um, but we want to make it accessible. The downside to any sort of privatized educational endeavor is that somebody's got to pay for it. Right. Right. That's the downside. So that inherently limits some people who don't come from a background of being able to pay for that. We want to eradicate that. So we are working on building out uh, essentially an endowment that can make this accessible to anybody as long as they agree to that code of conduct, as long as they agree to be a good human being, as long as we can agree around that basic standard of like work, we're, we're going to tell the truth. We're going to you know work hard. We're going to treat each other well. We're going to go try to serve other human beings. We're going to be honorable. Um, we're going to be committed. Commitment is a word that just gets thrown around right now right? No, committed. I'm going to do the things I say I'm going to do. I'm going to say what I mean. I'm going to mean what I say. You find those people, we want it to be accessible. So we've got two different foundations um, that people can donate to. And one of those foundations is a public facing charity where we can start to take a look at state grants, um, you know, school choice money, things like that. Um, and we're open to that as long as it doesn't go, you know, we don't have to bend the knee to a specific politician or to a specific state standards or require, like, I'm not going to play that game, but we want to be able to do that and pour into our campuses and into our families and the communities. And then we have a private foundation, hundred percent of that money that comes in 
goes right back out. Um, people can donate directly to it. But one of the ways that we have created that I think is going to be the most uh, effective thing that no other school system is doing is we created a payment processing system. Now, part of this was because Stripe held our money. Stripe actually in a, a live event that B and I did, um, Stripe was like, no, we don't like that you guys are doing this around men. They shut it down, gave back like $100,000 worth of, of ticket sales without telling us like, wow, like we've had issues. That's un right. it's unfortunate because the conversation that we're having right now is not a political conversation at all. This is about a strong foundation That's for right. human for beings. Bingo. It is this is not are you conservative, are you liberal, are you on the right or the left? This at all. is about raising so. and being capable humans who want to serve humanity. Bingo. But we were targeted on that. So we went, okay, well, what's one of the rules? What's rule number six? No complaining, fix it. <laughs> so we're like, okay, what are we going to do? So we created our own payment processing system. We actually work with an organization that's been doing it for like 12, 13 years. Um, and we created Apogee Pays. Apogee Pays allows any business that uses Stripe or PayPal or has a point of sale or whatever, we can go in, we can match exactly what they're doing now, match the rate, whatever that looks like now. Mm. And instead of us making money on the margin like Stripe or PayPal does, that money goes directly into the Apogee Strong Foundation. So just by doing business like you've always done business, you are helping us to make this accessible to everybody. And as people are listening to this and they're probably thinking, what is the difference in the structure of the education? For example, when when I heard about this, I think I contacted you. I actually think that that's how we were first connected. Again, we have many, many mutual yeah, friends. But I don't I even was, remember how we got connected. I was so interested in, we were moving to Houston and I think I messaged you and I said, is there an Apogee school in Houston for the children? And it's not at a place where it, it is available yet, a, a campus yet that I, I know of. I, I know that they're coming. But the, the question is, are they going to learn foundational things like mathematics or music? What are the things that they're going to learn in the curriculum? And what are the things that you feel, again, having been in education for two decades, that you think are critical? to understanding and development? That's the best question right there, right? Is so what are the things that are critical? What are the things that do need to be there? Because what'll happen is everybody has their idea of what they want their kids to learn based on their own perspective. Like I want my kid, every, every kid needs to learn music. And then some families are like, no, not every kid needs to learn music, All right? Some some people go, uh, every, you know, I want my, my, my child to, you know, learn to take apart a freaking rocket ship. And I want my child to be able to perform surgery. And I want my child, mm -hmm. right? So everybody has their various, their bent. And there's no way any educational institution can do all things for all people at all times. So it is, how do you structure it so that you have what we're talking about here, a capable individual who has self-confidence and self-awareness right now is building these fundamental, this fundamental foundation. They're rooted to those factory settings. And then as the world continues to change, as they go forward, they are aware enough, confident enough, capable enough to adapt along with it. They can learn what they want to learn when they need to learn it. And they can unlearn something that's no longer relevant. They can't, so like, that's what we're doing is building that foundation. Mm -hmm. So on our campuses, which by the way, I'm, um, Tomble is the closest one to you. How far that's away is that? It's for 2024, I don't know. I think within an hour probably, but 2025, I'm uh, Woodlands area, um, Hughes, like we've got people that are applying out in this area too. So I, that'll, it'll be here you'll, you'll sooner keep me, rather you'll than keep later. Me in the, yes, ma'am. Dang right. So um, from a foundational aspect on our campuses, we've got a few buckets. We don't, school says life works in subjects. Obviously that's not true. Um, so we have, we have buckets. So one is that physical education bucket. Yes. Physical fitness, health, fitness matters. So depending on our affiliate. So again, these are independently owned and operated. Some of our affiliates own CrossFit gyms. I was just wondering, are they going to learn jujitsu? Some are of they our affiliates own jujitsu studios. Yeah. Some of our affiliates. So it's a yes. And physical fitness on the daily might be calisthenics might be kickboxing might be jujitsu might be crossfit style work it doesn't yes physical fitness matters it's not freaking dodgeball it's not let's sign your kid out so they don't have to actually work no we want them to actually be physically active 
That's something that's uh, non-negotiable on campus. Another non-negotiable is what we were talking about earlier, like the Socratic method. So having Socratic conversations. So having daily Socratic conversations, speech, debate, logic, rhetoric, those things matter. Understanding how to think logically, actually giving them the building blocks of what thinking looks like. Which is super cool. And also many adults don't know how to do that. They absolutely don't know how to do that, right? <laughs> Nor can they engage in civil discourse, which is a part of that too, right? At the end of at the end of the day, that you and I will agree on much. At some point, we could find something we disagree on. And it's the way in which you handle the disagreement. How do you handle that disagreement, right? I'm okay with the fact that Gabby is going to disagree with me on something. I would love to hear your evidence. I'd love to share mine. Maybe I change my mind. Maybe you change yours. Maybe neither one of us changes. We still go forward and go, cool. We're still friends. Let's <laughs> yes. go. Right? right? Like yeah. that's a thing that you can do um, and not be emotionally wrapped up and all this kind of stuff. Which so, is all we see online. That's all we see online. And by the way, that's all we see a lot of times in person with certain people. I mean, it's unfortunate because that's where we've, that's where we've gotten to, right? So um, understanding that, understanding logical fallacies, um, how to actually articulate, you know, and communicate um, your ideas matter. So that's, that's its own specific bucket is kind of that critical thinking bucket and daily exercises around that. The academics are a part of that. Academics are great, but academics are put on a pedestal as if all people need all these things at the exact same, it's again, provably ridiculous, but the academics matter. We're just not going to have somebody sit there and lecture everybody. We're not going to pretend that everybody needs algebra at 12. At, so you have academic options. Sure. If you want to use a textbook, great. Most people, when's the last time you use a, a textbook? All the time. So, I'm the wrong person to ask. Yeah, it's a good point. You're Because you're in academia. And your husband's yes. going to be the same thing. Yes. I the use... vast majority of people, how often do they use a textbook? In fact, I just purchased a new one. Nerd. All to exercise. Uh, no, just, exactly. Yeah, exercise kidding. metabolism. That's I mean, awesome. But yeah. yeah. But very few people We'll, we'll do that, right? When I say that, though, I do question everything in the textbook. I get the textbook. You've been taught to do that, which is great. That's what you should be doing. But I, I use a textbook. The textbook is not gospel because I need to understand it, the holes in the thing. I'm not, be able to I'm not that. blinded. It. I you should be able to deal with every source for everything, right? So, but if people want to use textbooks, cool. We can use textbooks. There's also, you know, when you're talking about the basic academia that kids go through in schools, right? Sal Khan's done a great job on Khan Academy and it's freaking free. Like it's free. So That's you right. Have, it's free. And it's three times the amount of work that you will do in any conveyor belt school to, to earn your way through to another level. Three times the amount. Like I know Sal personally and it is the Khan Academy right the online uh -huh. learning yeah. I've watched I have watched all it. so like that's all there there's a number to synthesis you know and what what Elon's developed with synthesis is pretty pretty legit for for math and it actually incorporates critical thinking in math and that's so it's great like there's there's the the traditional academia has its place and there's there's its own bucket that's there so that's great how about collaborating around projects that actually matter? So taking on a real world project. So for this year, we've got seven sessions in our school years. Each session's four to six weeks. And there's always a themed project. This is where we're exposing them to all kinds of things in a real world fashion. And we're allowing them to collaborate to create something, not just consume. School's all about consuming. Education means you learn through creating, right? You actually have an experience of doing something. So they're going to create a Renaissance fair based on this entire concept of what does it mean to live by a code? What is the history of looking mm. at how do cultures develop a code? How do families develop a code? What does that mean to incorporate that? Um, so they're going through an entire uh, project-based experience, and then they're putting on a Renaissance fair for their community to talk about the history of building out a code and what is the code they want for their campus. And they're going into like a CEO of my own life where they're talking about time and energy management. They're figuring out how to structure mm. schedules and goals. And that's also when we're going to put in a, um, we're going to put in a campus economy during that session as well. So that there's, Hey, you do a job, you get paid for the job. You do a harder job. Maybe you get more money for the job. You want to try to fit like actually we're learning how money works, right? So we have an internal economy that they're going to take on. Um, the next one is health is wealth, diving into human physiology. And, and understanding breath work and understanding, um, you know, what nutrition actually means, what it looks like. How do you actually cook real healthy food? And we want to eventually get our chefs on campus to be kids. One of my campuses, the head chef on campus who's making real food every single day. He went down and worked with Weston A. Price, came in. He's responsible every day for cooking all of the meals on campus, real food every day. He goes to the store, figures out how to source it, runs the school lunch program, hires middle school students as his sous chef. Right? So they're learning how real skills and they're putting out real food every single day. So for our kids, health, nutrition matters. Um, 
going into a session on like uh, sh building shelters and building fires and how to actually grow your own food, going into a shark tank uh, session where you're building out a mock business, you're having to learn what a PNL is, you're having to source real materials, and you're having to go give a pitch to local investors. Um, then we have a real business fair. They're actually all starting businesses. Not that everybody should be an entrepreneur, but the entrepreneurial skill set always matters. It does. So they're starting a real business, taking projects and services to the public. Like these are real things that matter. So they have projects around real world scenarios and then massive responsibilities from cleaning campus to taking care of things to internships and apprenticeships in fields they think they want to work in. Again, as much exposure as humanly possible to all the things that are going to allow them to know who they are and have an idea of where they're going. I don't know about you. I had no clue. Even with my straight A's, I knew I was good at meeting girls and I was good at playing sports. That's what I was good at. So then I'm like, guess I'll go to college. Got better at girls, got better at sports. Still got my straight A's. And then went, cool. Now what? I don't know. I know how to play school. I don't know who I am. I don't know what I have to offer the world. Somebody help me. I was told I get this college degree and, and jobs are just going to be, you know, coming after me, man. It's not the way it works. No, it's not. Thank you to First Form for sponsoring this episode of the show. As we talk about families and children, I wanted to highlight their M Factor Kiddos Mixed Berry Multivitamin. They are delicious. I may or may not have tried them myself. Uh, okay, I did. And each gummy has vitamin A and C and D and E and B6 and folate, B12, things that growing children need. It's really important that we understand our kids kind of eat uh, a little bit, whatever they want. And that's why I think it's really important that kids take a multivitamin. First Form does a great job. Their M Factor kiddos taste amazing. Your kids will like them. They look like gummy bears. Grab yours. Go to firstform.com slash Dr. Lion. That's firstform.com slash Dr. Lion. What is the ultimate vision? If you were to sum it up in one to two statements, I know your mission statement, and I want to hear what is the dream? How many people are doing this? Are we challenging traditional schooling versus education? And who are we producing and in what time frame? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, Tim was just on uh, Sean Ryan's show and and uh, I haven't gotten to listen. I got the episode in the queue for the for the flight home. And uh, one of the things that I heard him say that he and I have talked about quite a bit is he says, we want to just completely abolish the Depart <laughs> Department of Education. Um, I'm all for it. Um, I don't think that's going anywhere anytime soon, but we want to rival it by creating something that is better and still as accessible. Right. So it's that foundation that we talked about to make this enough of an endowment process to make these campuses available to anybody who believes this is what education should look like. One of the best things CrossFit did was as they spread, you know, kind of this grassroots organization that, that spread, they invited community. They invited people to do things a way that wasn't being done. Um, they didn't try to go in and do it inside your big boxes, your ballets, your 24 hour fitness, your gold's gyms. They didn't necessarily go in there and do it. And again, I'm not saying I love CrossFit. I don't love CrossFit. That's not the point. The point is the, the model. So they went in and they did something that uh, people responded to and people had good, uh, good results with. And what happened was a lot of your big box gyms started incorporating CrossFit style classes, right? For us, Conveyor belt schools, public schools, government schools, they're not going away. We know they're not going away. But what if we just make the alternative so well-known, so attractive, so uh, just ridden with stories of transformation that it can't be denied and they have to start going, huh, maybe we'll add some more projects here. Huh, maybe we'll start. And hey, then corporate America starts going, hey, we, we already have this, by the way. We have corporations reaching out going, hey, I heard this young man. He's on, this, on the, the podcast. I heard him asking questions. How old is he? I'm like, oh, he's 18. Cool. We'll move him. Um, we want him. We'll move him out here to Texas from Florida where he lives. We want him for this job. He's brilliant. He's articulate. He's phenomenal. 
And and I'm like, yeah, here's his digital portfolio of leadership, right? So extraordinary. So it's extraordinary. We want hundreds of campuses that are educating the entire family. We want mom and dad to learn to be more sovereign. We want mom and dad to learn to be able to start their own foundations, to go be able to give in in ways that they want to give, to get out of the 1040 system, get into a 1041 system. They have more control over their life, more sovereignty, more freedom. We want the young people to grow up knowing who they are. And we want all of them impacting the communities in ways that they want to impact the communities. So we want you know, really in the next five years, I'm hopeful for, for 500 campuses. I'm hopeful for an endowment that makes all of those things accessible to every single person. I don't need to make a damn dollar on it. And I know Tim feels the same way. I don't care. Um, I want Apogee to go down as a, as a household name here in the next five years of going, well, this is, it's, you got school or you have an Apogee campus and pick one. Well done. Well done. Matt, Boudreaux. Got it. Yeah, nailed it. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming on, for sharing your mission, your wisdom. You are truly a purpose-driven individual. Thank you. It is inspiring and it is necessary. It's more necessary at this moment than any other time. Where can people find you? We will, of course, link everything. This will go out in the newsletters. This will, we will make you available and the Apogee School online community available to everyone. But thank you so much. I appreciate that very much. And it's, it's definitely an honor. And thank you for being on the same team. And, um, you know, anytime we get a platform to just speak about what we're doing is, is a blessing. So um, Apogee Strong, A-P-O-G-E-E strong.com is the place to go. Um, that'll link you to, we got a little documentary that's on there. You got all of our programs, again, designed to stand alone um, or come together. You'll be able to get a map um, to where all the campuses are located. Um, there'll be a section to start filling out where you say, hey, I'd like to maybe bring one to my community. Um, so we'll start having conversations. So apogeestrong.com is the way to go. Um, if you want to you know, look at how your business, if you're an entrepreneur and you want to look at how your business can help perpetuate the mission, um, apogeepays.com uh, is the way to go on that. Apogeestrongfoundation.org if you want to donate directly. All those places are great. But uh, it's an honor for anybody to even check it out. Um, And even if they just hear this and have nothing to do with that, but it makes them be more intentional with how they lead in the household and the young people, then it's a win, man. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah, thank you.